A time of worship and fellowship with one another and our God in heaven to sing and pray together, take the Lord's Supper. And now as we are going to continue in time of study together, we're going to be studying from John chapter 10, verse 3 through 4, and a few others tacked on towards the end, verses 9 and 10. But we're wanting to study today about the shepherd and the sheep. John 10, verse 1 beginning, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. As we closed our Bible study time together, we were mentioning how the information from chapter 9 bleeds into and finds its continuation in chapter 10. And that what Jesus is bringing up is not a spur-of-the-moment thought of, well, let me go into this discussion of I'm the shepherd and I'm calling my sheep and so on and so forth, but it is very much intertwined and intermingled with what was brought before. And it is by anticipation that our Lord Jesus laid down in this illustration the relationship which should be obtained between Himself and His people, those that are going to be His followers. Now, we have just dissected last week and in previous sermons and lessons together, the relationship that we hold with Christ in us being disciples and with Christ as being our master or our teacher and how it is that as disciples we're supposed to follow the one that is teaching us and instructing us. Well, that is still very much connected to our study today. That in fact there is a leader that is there wanting to guide us and that we are in the position in this relationship and in this fellowship of being his follower. So now we just have it being presented to us in a different different form, in a different fashion. It's not the teacher-student relationship. Now it's a shepherd and sheep. But it's still all the same. There's a leader and there are followers. And when we examine, or when we did examine, the kind of master that Jesus is offering to be for His disciples, and then as we will consider today, the kind of shepherd that Jesus is wanting to be for His sheep, it should make us want to follow. That it's not one of these relationships of, well, yeah, I guess I, I, guess I will go after you after all there's nobody better to go after and it's not a situation of where Jesus is trying to force or bind anybody into coming and being being a follower it's purely by choice and by what our desire is and as we have been depicted for us in this section the kind of shepherd that Jesus is contrasted to the shepherd that Israel had at this time with the Pharisees and Sadducees and others The contrast is clear. It's as different as night and day. As to the leaders that they had and the kind of leader that they could have, and that's point number one that we're wanting to discuss from this text, is that we're wanting to consider the shepherd's treatment of his flock. Okay, Jesus, you want us to follow you, and you're giving us this illustration of a shepherd with sheep. Well, just what kind of shepherd are you going to be? The first thing that jumped out at me when discussing how it is that Jesus is going to be with His people and with His sheep actually comes in verse 4, when it makes mention of the fact that He goeth before them. 
This is not how hurting is normally depicted. Now, it's good that we live here in Montana because we have a lot of hurting that goes on. You have people around in this area, they still go on cattle drives. Well, that right there, that very phrase, cattle drive, is depicting how normally herding is done. And that you have people in the rear pushing the cow or sheep where they're wanting them to go. That's not the depiction that we have here of Jesus. And even with this depiction that's given by Jesus at this time, it's very different even in that time frame of how Oriental shepherds were involved in going out and gathering their herds or gathering their flocks. It's very much like this. Well, okay, you drive them wherever you want them to go. You're behind and you're pushing and pushing. And even in some areas, you have dogs that are used. And how nasty that can end up being. They're just constantly nipping at the sheep's heels or the cow's feet, trying to get them to go. And so, you know, a lot of this is a driving of fear. But the way that Christ is depicted, He's not driving His flock away from Him. But it's just as was pictured on our very first slide, our title slide. He draws them to Him. He is out in front, leading, guiding. He does not force His sheep into going anywhere. It's that relationship of, oh, here's the Master. I know He's going to do good for me. He's, in fact, just leading me where I'm supposed to go. And this has been done for the entirety of Jesus' human life at this point. We have witnessed it in His circumstances of life, in His character, and in His toils, and ultimately in His sufferings and in His death. That He's not just simply telling people which way they're needing to go, how they're needing to behave, what kind of character traits they're supposed to have. He's leading them through that. He's doing these things. And from this, we have a great lesson that's being presented to us when it comes to the element of leadership. What is it that makes a good leader? And especially in this context that we have Jesus being described as the shepherd and then within the church there's supposed to be an eldership and then deacons that are underneath that or a side of that to help guide and to direct and lead the church. And they are described as being pastors or shepherds. Well, what kind of leaders are they supposed to be? A leader, whether it's in the church, in business, military, what have you, a good leader is one that is guiding the people in a work. He's not just simply back towards the back, barking orders. That's not a leader, that's a manager. And they're two very different things. And thus Jesus is giving the representation, hey, I'm in this with you. The way that I'm leading you, I'm going through that same way. And that just simply is, we need to follow. He's out in front, showing the way. And He knows the way. He's been sent <clears throat> by the Father. He was there in heaven. He knows the heavenly way and He just simply says, you can follow me. Or if you desire to go your own way, you can go your own way. But in realizing that element of the kind of leader, a true leader that he's wanting to be, then okay, it should be an easy choice for the sheep to come along and to follow. But then you also consider verse 3. Again, we're seeing special treatment that's being given to the sheep inside of this flock. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And notice what they're hearing about his voice. 
and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. This implies individual knowledge of all of his sheep. Now again, the reason why this is being laid out is because most of these individuals in Israel, most of them are shepherds. And if they're not shepherds themselves, they have shepherds around because they are continuously having to offer as a sacrifice a lamb. So you've got to have a lot of these things in reserve. And to picture these things in these elements in the physical realm, even today, when you know of people that are involved in ranching or if they're involved in keeping sheep, and especially sheep that they're going to use for meat. Now, it's just a rhetorical question. I'm not wanting anybody to, to blurt it out. But if you're going to use animals for meat, what's the one thing people tell you not to do? You don't name them. Because that brings attachment. So if you were to go and drive around here in Lake County throughout all these pastures, you're going to see the cows, they're numbered. The sheep, they just simply wear a number. That's, in, that's not personable. Okay, you're 0190, it's time for you to go. But to put names with these creatures brings about a level of intimacy, relationship, closeness. You're no longer just a number. You're no longer just something to be slaughtered for meat. You're no longer just a piece of property or dollar signs, if you will, something to be sold. You have a special place. So it's a matter of he's not just simply marking us, but we're being named. He knows our names. And thus that denotes his property, possession with them, but also it shows about interest in their welfare. There's a deeper significance being placed on this possession. And also we have mentioned twice this leading element. He calls, them, calls his sheep by name. And again, he leads them out. Not driving, not pushing. He's out in front. He's saying, come on. But then we also must ask, since we have twice mentioned about this leading, well, okay, he's leading us, but where are we being led? Where is it that we're going that we should just be willing to follow? We well, drop down to verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pastures. You connect the same imagery over to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And that's not saying that I shall not want the shepherd. It's saying, I do not have any want of anything. Because I'm being provided for to the ultimate degree that with the Lord as my shepherd, I am content. I shall not want. There's not anything else that I could possibly want or need. He maketh me to lie down in green, green pastures. He leads them out into green pastures. He calls them to follow Him here and there. But His command, His calling forth is coming out as an invitation. And thus when we are able to realize and recognize that the leading that He is giving to us, where it is that he's taking us is to a place of provision 
And as we mentioned with our previous point, by giving us the names is because of the desire he has of relationship. The attraction of the love of the shepherd. It's just natural for the sheep to follow. And so he conducts them from place to place to the pastures where he feeds them and then to the sheepfold where he protects them. So it ends up being full provisions being made. There's not anything that we're having to do aside from follow Him. So that then brings us, in view of the treatment by the master, then brings to us the response of the sheep. If this is the kind of master, the kind of shepherd that he's wanting to be, then what should our response be? Verse 3, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. Drop down to verse 4 and 5. We have been shown to us, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. Here's the reason why. For they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. His sheep hear and know his voice. Christ's tones, when he speaks to his own, are gentle and kind. It's language that is compassionate and that is, in fact, encouraging. His voice is, therefore, suited especially to the timid, to the feeble, to the helpless. And to this class of people, to these people that take on these characteristics... It is indeed a sweet and cheering and comforting sound. Just like with a physical shepherd dealing with his own sheep. That whenever they see their shepherd coming along, they automatically start heading in that direction. Because they know either they're going to be moved from this pasture to a new one, or they're actually going to get some extra type of feed. And then if they don't see the shepherd, just by the sound and recognition of their voice, brings about the same action. But then, verse 5, the contrast of that. How it is that the sheep or the people of Christ are deaf to other voices. But yet that great amount of attention to the true voice, to that authority is recognized. And again, this can be tested and it can be shown to be true. We have some friends that keep sheep and they can go out there, show up, call for them and they'll come running. But if I were to show up, When I do show up out at their sheep farm, sheep don't do anything. It's almost as if I'm not even there. And if I were trying to call them and have them do anything, again, it's like I don't exist. But you get the actual people out there that deal with them on an everyday basis and are involved in moving them from place to place, now they pay attention. And that's how we're supposed to be. That's the situation of when Jesus says jump, we say how high. When he calls, we hear. We know that it's him. And something that's different, the voice of some stranger, we don't respond. The sheep have heard this voice before. They know it and they love it. And they distinguish it from every other voice that's out there. 
And so because of this, they gratefully and gladly hear the voice of the beloved shepherd. But as we have gone through our studies, we know that it's not enough to just simply hear the voice. Because if the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd and they don't respond, they're not going to get the benefits. And so we have presented to us in verse 4 of John 10. What's the response to be of these sheep in view of what it is the shepherd is providing. They obey and they follow. John 10, 4, When he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. Why? For they know his voice. And here we have been presented to us the level of submission on the part of the sheep. The voice is enough to generate a response. The true sheep of the shepherd, they do not wait around for the crook or the staff to where there has to be some type of physical contribution, some corporal punishment being placed on the part of the shepherd so as to get them to do what he says. No, just to hear the voice is enough. We don't need anything else. The true sheep, they are obedient to the shepherd's word of gentle authority. He says, come. They come. He says, we're going here. They go. They don't have to be drug along. They don't have to be beat. They don't have to be driven. None of that stuff. It is just full submission. Because of the wonderful Savior that He is. It is enough for them that the way in which they are led is His way. When we consider this and we think about this from the aspect of leader-follower relationship, you know, it's a lot easier to be a follower than it is a leader. Now, a lot of people are not satisfied with being followers, but then when it comes time for them to be put into a place of leadership, they don't want to be a leader either. Because they realize that a leader has to take in a, all kinds of things in consideration of where are the people going to go. Same thing with the shepherd. Okay, I cannot let them pasture too long out here because they'll end up destroying this and we won't be able to circle back to it later on in the year. Well, I can't let them stay in this area too long because, you know, there's not enough water here to take care of everybody. So now we've got to start making all these kind of decisions and calls that have to be made. You know what? I don't really want to deal with all of that. Then be a follower. But if you're going to be a follower, then be a true follower. But a lot of people that claim to want to be a Christian, a disciple, a sheep, they're not really dedicated to being a follower. And that in everything that we see the Master and our Shepherd leading us in that we are supposed to do in the areas and the direction in which we're needing to go, they're wanting to buck against that and rear up against that and start heading in their own direction. It's not what we're needing to do. It's not how we're needing to be. And that Jesus is already presented in John 8 and verse 12, this very same, you know, this very same idea. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. 
you know what, that sounds good to me. I do not want to have to be in the position of this level of leadership to have to make these kind of calls. So I'll submit to the shepherd. And that with our submission, with our following, there's, you know, there's no questioning. As is being shown from this illustration that Jesus is laying forth, there's no hesitation, there's no delay. The sheep just follow wherever the shepherd leads. And so because of that, they have rest. And they have peace. John 10, 9 and 10, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. Shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's what the shepherd is offering. And in realizing that that is what he's wanting to bring for all of those that will follow him and obey him, then, okay, I'll obey. I'll follow. Because at the end of all of this, what do I really know? What do I know about getting to heaven? I've never been there. Never seen it. Jesus has. Okay, then he's qualified to lead. When it comes to the matters of holiness, righteousness, and living a pure and virtuous life, what would I know of that, of my own understanding and my own knowledge? I wouldn't. But Jesus, as being the Word before He became flesh and being there in the presence of God, He knows what purity is. He knows what holiness and virtue is. Okay, so I'll follow His example. When a person is willing to... Uh, to submit, obey, and follow to this degree. There's no fear of danger. There is no foe. There is no enemy while the shepherd watches over them and defends them that can attack them. And they do not need to ask why it is that we're having to take this path that's being marked out before us or that's being marked out and laid out before them. And it's because they have perfect confidence in their divine leader. Where he goes, I will follow. We sang together, Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Do we really mean that? Or are we going to be like some children that when they take their parent's hand and they want to start trying to pull their parent around the parking lot? Well, I want to go this way. Well, I want to go that way. You may want to go a lot of ways. It doesn't mean that you need to. But Jesus wants to lead us in the way that we should go, that we need to go. To reach these things that he's offering. The sheep do not ask, but where are we going? Because they are satisfied if they are in the pasture, if they are in the fold of the one who is the shepherd and bishop of the soul.
I don't have to ask where, don't have to ask why. As long as the shepherd is in view, as long as I'm able to hear his voice and where it is that he's leading and he's guiding, I'm just happy to be wherever he is. And it's with this imagery that Jesus is trying to invite people at that time, and he's still trying to invite people today. Be my sheep. Be a part of this fold. Be a part of this group that is following what the leader says, and you'll be taken care of. And that in obeying the Savior's plan of salvation to hear the truth of the gospel, to be willing to believe in that gospel and all that He has taught, and be willing to repent. Okay, I have been trying to go my own way. Perhaps I have been in a state of blindness like these Pharisees and I've not been wanting to submit and to yield this area of my life, but now I realize what I'm missing out on. I'm not fully dedicated to this. I'm halfway allowing you to lead. Well, repent of that mindset. Repent of those sins that would cause you to be separated from the shepherd and allow yourself to be brought in. Be willing to confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God be baptized in water for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness, in order to obtain remission and forgiveness. And then once that is done, be faithful to the shepherd. Listen for his voice. Listen for his call. Watch for his guidance. But even as we discuss these elements, and we're looking at this from the standpoint of, well, we're inviting these lost sinners, those that are out in the world, to come in and to be led by the Savior. We need to remember John 10 is first in its context a message being offered to those that were already in covenant with God. that here are people that are supposed to be His sheep, but they're not following Him. Matthew 10, the imagery is being given, how that Jesus looked upon the multitude, had compassion on them, for they were gone astray as sheep without a shepherd. That's Israel. And so this information that Jesus is giving is for them. You've left the fold. This is Matthew 18. Leaving the 90 and 9 and going after the 1. He is trying to call Israel home. And the same invitation is for us that have been in the fold, but then found ourselves going out of it. And that happens to physical sheep. You're within your nice netted area. But then you know what? There's something on that side of the fence that just gets your attention. And you just got to go get it. You leave your nice protected area, you drop, um, hop that fence to go get what you thought that you needed and you find yourself in something you didn't need to be in. But what does the shepherd do? Goes and gets them. Brings them back.
And so the encouragement is for us as members of the Lord's church as it was to those in the Hebrew letter. Throughout all of this epistle <clears throat> to where the encouragement is, do not go back to the law of Moses. Hold fast to the gospel, to the light in which you have received. And you have all of those Old Testament illustrations of how Old Testament Israel constantly kicked against God, rebelled against God, found themselves in states of hardness of heart, disbelief, and rebellion. And the Hebrew writer brings the epistle to a close like this. 1320, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. Here we are in, in the book of Hebrews and we've not left our imagery, not left our illustration. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd. And then we're supposed to be perfect in every good work. To do His will to be obedient, to submit, to have sheep that follow the shepherd. And then even Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 4. Again, this imagery of Jesus and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. but that's only if we see Him as being the chief shepherd. The great and supreme shepherd that's going to tend for us and care for us, leading us in the path of righteousness and leading us to safety and protection. And that if we will simply follow Him. Hear His voice. Do what He says. And this is what waits for us when He returns. And we offer at this time, as we close <clears throat> our time of assembly together, if anyone has a need in any one of these areas in obeying the gospel, becoming a Christian, or for those of us that are Christians, these sheep, they're supposed to be in this sheep fold, and we've allowed ourselves to wander away. The shepherd's voice is still there, calling us to return. But if any have a need, we offer this time as we stand and as we sing together.